You're listening to the Bird Dog Babe Podcast with my mom, Courtney Bastion. This podcast is sponsored by Purina Pro Plan, Boss Shot Shells, and Onyx Hunt. And today's episode is brought to you by Puffin Drinkware. You're going to want to have your heat lamps. You're going to want to have like the little area that they're in. And it's about four chicks per square foot. The bedding is key too. You want straw or large wood chips. You don't want anything else smaller. Otherwise, they can ingest them. So you're going to want to do the red bulb. So if you do like a white bulb, um, that emits too much light. And then that can actually get them to be more aggravated and pick on each other and start fighting and stuff like that. So the darker the room along with the red bulb is going to be um, more adequate if you would use like a natural light or bright light. Puffin Drinkware koozies outfit your soda, beer, and wine for all four seasons in beverage jackets, flannels, parkas, vests, and sleeping bags. The sleeping bag version also comes in a wine bag. These koozies are super adorable and fun. They're made by a company out of Bend, Oregon. I first saw them at the grand opening of Shields in Missoula, Montana last year and bought a couple. They're under 20 bucks, which makes for a perfect gift idea. And what was really neat is after a chucker hunt a couple months ago, as I popped the top of a cold one on the tailgate, my hunting buddy also brought over her beverage wrapped in a puffin. Keep your friends close and your drinks cozy. Go to thebirddogbabe.com forward slash puffin and use promo code birddogbabexpdw. That's birddogbabex and then P as in puffin, D as in drink, W as in wear, PDW, to get 10% off your purchase. But also, puffins, as in the seabird, they're pretty cool too. Patreon patrons, the amazing peeps supporting this podcast, keeping the lights on in my closet and the MP3s rolling. We had a great webinar last week with Jay Lee Schwartz on the basics of whistle training. If you missed it, be sure to check it out. I know some that have watched it more than once because it's that good. It's $5 per month to join or $54 for a year. So if you enjoy this podcast, you want to get in on the additional and bigger discounts, some awesome giveaways, which I do often, educational webinars, oh, and also be the first to hear when registration opens for hunting camps because those go really fast. Head over to patreon.com forward slash the bird dog babe to join. Thanks to my partners, Siren Shotguns and Dakota 283. I'm closing up dates for shooting camps and hunting camps right now, and I'm so grateful for Siren, Ziza Garini, and Fab Arm for providing shotguns for these events. It makes a huge difference when you shoot a gun that actually fits you. And be sure to check out the new products added to the Dakota 283 lineup. They now have forever inserts for all G3 kennels. So you only have to purchase one crate for the entire life of your dog and use the insert while they're still puppies. Dakota 283 now also has kennel mats that perfectly fit into the G3 kennels. Be sure to use promo code BIRDDOGBABE for 10% off any Dakota 283 purchase. My guest today is April, a manager at McFarland Pheasants in Janesville, Wisconsin. It's that time of year when many of us are making plans for the amount of birds we'll need for this training and testing season. And now is the time to get your bird orders in. Unless you raise and keep your own birds, chances are you're at the mercy of the bird availability from your club or organization. Or maybe you do have the space or several of your training buddies can go in together and split the costs and share the duties. April walks us through the advantages of buying eggs versus chicks versus mature birds as well as basic rearing and husbandry tips. All right, and let's get after it. Hey, April, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah. If you could share with us uh, what, where you are coming from and in your title there. Yeah. So I work for McFarland Pheasants in Janesville, Wisconsin. Um, It's the largest American pheasant farm in um, America. I have been here for six years, and I am the chick and egg sales account manager, along with the pet food sales account manager as well. Pretty busy times right now? Yeah, so I used to have a slow season, which is, um, you know, right between fall and spring. But now doing the pet food side of things, it's not really a slow season. You're constantly um, doing something from day to day. 
you guys are doing the entire kind of start to finish there. So you're breeding, you're incubating, mm-hmm. and and then you're you're some of the birds you're growing completely out, right? Right. Yeah. So we go from, um, you know, the breeding side of things. Um, we actually have two sets. We have breeding for our um, dressed food line, and then we have breeding for our chicks, and then we raise them for matures. Um, so we kind of have two sides of things with breeding. So what would be the difference between those different ones you just mentioned? Yeah, so the dressed food side of things, um, it's actually a white ring neck um, that we own the genetics to. So we, um, you know, enhance them and try to figure out their genetics um, to where they grow a certain point. Um, and then we slaughter them at a certain point and then they go from, you know, the, the slaughter plant to dressed in our store. Or we have distributors all around um, the United States as well and grocery stores that carry our pheasant too. And then we have, you know, the regular breeding side of things with our ringneck Kansas Manchurian and then our mutants as well. Neat. Really cool. I didn't know that you guys had all that going on. So this is going to be fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, like a lot of the, the audience and um, myself personally, we, you know, we're going to like these training days, like the dog clubs and and we're buying birds there. Sometimes people have the ability to raise chicks and have mm-hmm. flight pens and you know, we keep birds on site to do the training like we do right here. What would you recommend as far as timing to start ordering chicks to have them ready for flight and ideal flyers? Yeah, so um, I would say we actually start our ordering process um, around Thanksgiving. That way it gives customers enough time to get their orders in. By the time February and March come around, our, it's pretty slim picking. So if you're looking for a ringneck, example, like right now, if you're looking for a ringneck rooster or a ringneck straight run, which is a mix of male and females, um, there isn't really much available. So then we have like our Kansas strain or our Manchurian or even our mutant strain um, that we still have. But it's going to be very limited at this point just because everyone's trying to get their orders in ahead of time and making sure they have birds um, and they don't have to go somewhere else. How old do they need to be to start being good flyers? Um, so they'll start they'll start jumping and um, flying around six six to eight weeks, um, but they're going to be starting to fly pretty pretty well by twelve to eighteen weeks. I mean, besides the pheasant, because I just ordered chucker from you. Was it mm-hmm. a week a week or two week? Maybe last week I ordered chucker, and I think those are being delivered or maybe end of May, April. I yeah, say. I think you're end of <laughs> April. Yeah. Okay. So what other, is it just chucker and pheasant you guys have there? So breeding here is just actually pheasant. We have a contract grower we actually um, go through for our chuckers. So we will grab the eggs, um, the chucker eggs, and then grab them from our contract person. And then we'll actually um, incubate those ourselves and um, sell them as chicks um, and matures. Okay. What are the advantages and disadvantages of buying chicks versus eggs? Um, the advantages are eggs are for pheasant and even partridge. They're very tricky to incubate. Um, so they have to be served at a, special, a certain temperature. Um, they have to be turned a certain time frame. The humidity has to be just right. Um, the dry and wet bulbs have to be a certain type uh, and um, you know, a certain temperature. So eggs are trickier to raise, but once you have it down, you have it down. So, um, you know, the plus side is you're, you're doing all that fun work yourself. Um, but it, I mean, if you want to do the chicks, a lot of the, a lot of people think it's easier just to buy the chicks instead of trying to incubate and learn all of the, um, ins and outs of incubation. Yeah. I, I can't imagine the incubation stuff. And there's so many different incubators out there and you guys probably have like the massive industrial ones, right? Right. Yeah. (laughs) Yep. Yep. Did you know that 94 out of the top 100 show dogs and 90 out of the top 100 sporting dogs are fueled by Purina Pro Plan? Lean muscle, great coats, small compact stool, 
all benefits to feeding a complete and balanced ProPlan formula. Every single ingredient serves a specific purpose. Stop by and visit me and the Purina team at the Southeastern Wildlife Expo in Charleston, South Carolina this weekend. We'll help you determine a ProPlan formula that's right for your dog. And if you breed or own five dogs or more, ask us how you can save money each time you buy a bag of Purina. Do yeah. you know the ratio of like how many pounds you feed per bird? I don't know, in like a month or something? I don't. Um, no, I don't. But, uh, you know, the, the crew on, on the farm has it down to a science. Uh, I'm just not sure of it. But, you know, you go into feed costs, for instance, feed has gotten more expensive through the last year. Um, so it's up to you if you really wanted to put all that feed and time into raising them, you know, from chicks to mature. Or if you just want to deal with, like, the mature, you buy them, you train them, you sell them, you release them, you hunt them, whatever you really want to do. Um, but your time in investing and feed is probably the two key things for raising chicks. And then, like I said, they're pretty they're harder to raise. Um, they're more pickier. Um, you don't want chuckers on the ground without changing the bedding too much otherwise they can get diseases and you can't mix them with other poultry because of the diseases so it just gets kind of tricky that way Mm -hmm. are pheasant as touchy that way too yes yep yeah pheasants as far as like diseases and stuff it's not as as um you know in depth as it is with the partridge but um you know chuck or the the pheasants you're still going to want to clean that bedding and stuff Mm -hmm. What type of setup is ideal if if we're buying a hundred day old chicks? Because I mean, first of all, you guys ship them all all over the U.S., right? Right. Yeah. So um, you're gonna want to have your heat lamps. You're gonna want to have like the little area that they're in, and it's about four chicks per square foot. Um, and then you know. The bedding is key, too. You want straw or large wood chips. You don't want anything else smaller. Otherwise, they can ingest them. So not like the wood shavings then? Right, right. Okay. Heat lamps, is there a preference? I know like some heat lamps have like the red bulbs. Yeah. So you're going to want to do the red bulb um, because any light. So if you do like a white bulb, um, that emits too much light. And then that can actually get them to be more aggravated. Um, and pick on each other and start fighting and stuff like that. So the darker the room along with the red, the red bulb is going to be um, more adequate. Mm-hmm. And then if you would use like natural light or bright light. And for water, would you recommend one of those metal water fountains? Yeah, so um, that might be okay once they're a little bit older. Um, when they're in their, you know, first four weeks, you're going to want something shallow so that way they're not going to drown when they try to get a drink or something like that. Um, and you're going to want to obviously give them fresh water every day. But we actually use nipple lines when they're older. But when, you know, as chicks and in the barns, um, you know, you could just put pans down, anything to where they're not going to get in there and drown. Okay. At what age do you do the nipple lines? Uh, that's about uh, six to eight weeks. Okay. What about electrolytes? We actually use a trick called Kool-Aid. Okay. Um, So we always recommend, I mean, you could use vitamin packs that we sell as well, or any vitamin pack for that matter. Um, When shipping is most stressful on the birds, pheasants and partridge. Um, So, you know, you could always mix a vitamin pack or um, any kind of electrolyte when you first get them, just because they're going to be drowsy, lethargic, um, stressed out. And when they're stressed for pheasants and partridge, their body just kind of shuts down. So um, giving them that added boost uh, will help them out. But we actually, since we don't obviously ship our chicks, but if you, we do notice like any pheasants or partridge that are lethargic, we just kind of put a little sugar or Kool-Aid in the water and it kind of gives them that bounce to start eating and stuff. Mm-hmm. That's a good trick. I did order some <laughs> of the, the vitamin mix from you guys. I mean, we do use that from time to time too. Um, you know, if we don't have like Kool-Aid or whatever, but, um, a lot of times we just, it depends on how many you have. If you have a bigger batch, you might as well just do the electrolytes. Um, it'll last them a lot longer and then it is for 75 gallons. So, um, you know, it goes a longer way than if you would do sugar or Kool-Aid. Mm-hmm. How long should they have the electrolytes for? Um, I would say the first three to five days. Oh, that's it. Okay. 
Yeah. Yeah, they're they're most stressed. Um, you know, they like they can like chicks can live off the yolk sac for 5 days. Um, so that's when they're most stressed. They might not eat for the first couple of days that you receive them. Um, you know, which is why the electric lights kind of come into play. And then mm-hmm. after a, uh, a couple of days, they should start eating and stuff and um, they're actually pretty bouncy. So if they're not bouncy and lethargic, just dip their beaks in that electrolyte and, um, you know, that should bring them back for a little bit. There are only two months until spring turkey season starts. Have you ordered your Boss Shot Shells yet? Boss Toms are non-toxic tungsten with two ounce payload that has been obsessively engineered for optimal pattern density and uniformity. Lee and the Boss Men are at the National Wild Turkey Federation Convention in Nashville this weekend. So be sure to stop by their booth, number 323, and get yourself some Boss Toms. Or, those that can't attend, head over to BossShotShells.com and order the best shells on the market and direct to consumer right to your door. What's the approximate mortality rate that we could maybe expect if we are having chicks shipped? Yeah, so we ship 5% free just to hopefully cover. Um, Usually it's 5%, um, you know, whatever losses you guys do have or anybody has. And if it's more than 5%, then we um, will do our best to, you know, reimburse. Well, we like to send chicks, so we'd send more chicks. And then, um, but it's usually within that 5%. Hopefully you don't have any. That would be ideal, but you never know how, um, you know, they're treated when they're shipped. I noticed too, the importance of food. It was like our Murdoch's and uh, tractor supply and even the feed store, none of them had the recommended food that you guys have. And so we got something else and we had them special order it in, which Mm -hmm. I wish I would have thought of beforehand before. Yeah. yeah, I think we went (laughs) to get the food two days before the chicks arrived and then found that out it wasn't the right stuff. So we had yeah. like a higher mortality rate because of that. And I didn't think it was going to yeah. be that, that much of a difference. Um, so what is the recommended feed for chicks? Yeah. So like I said, they're trickier to raise. Um, yeah. Recommended when the first three weeks is about a 28% um, protein. So a lot of that is like a turkey starter or a game bird starter. Um, turkey starter, what I've been finding is a 27%. And that's going to be equally as good. Um, So either like a 27 or a 28. And then, you know, after between three and six weeks, you can bump them down to like a 26%. um, And then six to eight weeks, you can go to a 24. And then, um, you know, gradually go down. And then once they're mature, about 18 to 21 weeks, you can go down to like a maintenance. And then that's what you usually find in your tractor supply and stuff like that. It's just like the maintenance. Right, right. And you're, yeah, I think it was the, the turkey starter um, was the one that they didn't have. And oh, no. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but we figured it out within a couple of days. They're good. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, what else with chicks? Is there anything else you guys do as far as supplementation, helping their survivability? Um, no, but I mean, what's key is giving them space. Um, so as, as long as you're just giving them space, because... Um, you know, they do after a certain while, usually like around four to six weeks, um, you know, they'll start picking at each other and pecking each other. Um, so that's why we always say darker, you know, darken that room and then, um, give them more space. So that way they have, you know, less people or birds around them to pick on them. Um, but that's pretty much the key, the key things that we do. And I found too, the importance of, cause I have two little toddlers who really enjoyed watching the chucker babies last oh, year, yeah. but you know, they go in there and then all the chucker gets scared and go to one side and then they pile mm-hmm. up on each other. And, yeah. and so that's, I mean, that's how they die. If there's not enough heat in there as well. Right. Like the, if they all right. go over yep. to a heat source or if they're all piling on each other, um, the little ones underneath get stuck. Yeah. Yep. And Um, you know, we think it's hot, but the ideal temperature when you first get them is 95 to 100 degrees. And, um, you know, and then the cool spots is going to be around like 80. So that way, you know, if they get too cold, they can go into that heat lamp. And then when they get too warm, they can kind of go in the other area where it's about 80 degrees. But um, that's also a reason why we ship so many chicks per box is just to kind of keep them safe and warm. um, So they don't get too cold and, you know, too stressed out. But 
if they're too cold, yeah, they will pile on each other. And then the, unfortunately, the little ones on the bottom get stuck. When you were just talking about the temperature there, would it be better to for us to put a thermometer kind of towards the bottom? Yeah, so I just have people check the temperature under that heat lamp, um, either with like a temp gun or something like that. Just check under under the heat lamp. Um, and then a thermometer, like in the, just e- even in that the brooder box or that little room that they're in, just to kind of keep an eye on the actual temperature in the room. Okay. Do you guys recommend anything for medication? Um, we don't. We are really lucky, and we have a vet um, that we have. And to be honest, we just let him do his thing. And, um, you know, we don't really have anything. A lot of times you can get feed with, you know, if you have partridges with, um, you know, that get coccidiosis, you can get coccidiostat in their, the medicated feed. Um, but there's some areas that actually don't have it anymore, so it's r- rare to find. But um, I just you know, we just recommend having a vet or a vet that knows, you know, the game birds. But we're um, pretty thankful for having our vet. At what age would you recommend uh, moving them from a brooder to a flight pen? Um, so we do that between um, six and eight weeks, depending on temperature um, and what the weather is outside. So right before they go outside, we actually put them the, their peepers on, um, so that way they're not fighting outside. And then we um, move them out, but we have to have a good stretch of weather. So we don't want any rain in the forecast or anything like that. So that way they're not adding more stress to, you know, what they're already going through. Mm -hmm. Could you describe what an ideal enclosure would look like? Um, so it all goes off of square footage. So, um, when they're mature, so around 18 to 21 weeks, you're going to want them like between 22 and 44 square foot feet. So if you have peepers on them, you could do 22 square feet per bird. Um, If you don't have that peeper, that blinder over them, um, you could do the 44. So like I said, the more square foot per bird, the better. So that way you're not going to have that mortality in your pen. The peepers, pheasants are the only ones that need that, right? Yeah, for the most part. um, Partridge, there are bits. They're called bits instead of peepers for partridge. Um, And actually for partridge, it's the opposite. It's actually the females that will be more aggressive towards the males and can kill the males. Um, Mm. But if you're going to keep them for a while, you could always throw a bit on them as well. So that way they're not fighting and killing each other. Can either of those, like could partridge be mixed with quail at all? Or is there too much? We don't. Yeah, we don't recommend mixing with other poultry just because of the diseases and stuff. Um, Mm -hmm. But, you know, the partridge, we say stay with partridge and the pheasant stay with partridge uh, or the pheasant stay with pheasant. You know, anything even for a pheasant, anything that looks different from them, they're going to pick on them. So, for example, we have a melanistic mutant that's really pretty and has the iridescence, black, blues, green, purples. And unfortunately, the, you know, other pheasants, the ringneck, Manchurian, Kansas, will actually pick on those ones just because they're not like them. So um, wow. it's just you just want to keep them kind of separated so that way, um, you know, the, the less mortality you have. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. Like the corn as well. A lot of people are like, well, I put corn in their feed, but, you know, now they're um, very lethargic. And pheasants, actually, they'll just pick whatever colors don't match. So they'll eat all that corn, and corn has no nutritional value to them and no, um, you know, doesn't have their calcium or anything that they need for their feathers or growth. And, um, you know, we just recommend not mixing it with corn. You can every once in a while, but um, we just don't recommend it just because they'll just pick it all out and it doesn't do you any good. Join the millions of hunters who trust Onyx Hunt to find more game, discover new access, and hunt smarter. Onyx is the number one GPS app and one of the most trusted tools for every hunt I go on. But what you may not realize is that Onyx is also a big advocate for public land access and stewardship. They have helped open nearly 60,000 acres of land for public access, and by 2023, they have a goal to help secure and improve public access to 150,000 acres. Go to onyxmaps.com and find out more ways to go confidently and have more success on your next hunt. Uh, Going back to the enclosure bit, um, flight pens, do you Mm -hmm. recommend having them elevated off the ground? Yeah, so we, ours are, um, you know, just like the, the, I believe they're 
10 foot high. I'm not quite sure. We do have a flight pen manual on our website. Um, and then in the middle, we'll put like a prop pole. And then that, I believe, goes up to 12 feet. So that way, you know, it's kind of elevated a little bit. Um, but for the most part, they don't do too much like flying in their pens unless they're scared or unless, um, you know, somebody goes next to them or a predator gets close, then they'll kind of flush the other way. Um, but we do put those prop posts in there um, mm -hmm. just so, you know, they're in there. And if it snows, it kind of like rolls off and stuff like that. Okay. Um, through the years, having birds at tests, they're good flyers. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes you mm -hmm. get birds that they're not good flyers. What makes the difference there? Do you have any idea? It's the, pretty much their, their weight. So um, like our Kansas ringneck are um, a lighter weight bird. They're about a pound less than our regular wing, ringneck. Um, so they are able to flush out really easily. Um, and as long as the weather is good where you don't have, you know, mud, you know, for instance, the snow will melt and then you have mud and then it refreezes, their tails kind of get stuck there and then will break off. So as long as you have a good stretch of weather, you're, the tails will grow how the tails are supposed to grow, which is pretty long. Um, but you just want, you know, the less weight, the better. So a lot of times some people overfeed, like our extra large are meant to be extra large for people to eat them. Um, but they're not going to be good for hunting just because they're not, you're, you're not going to get them off the ground. So it would be silly to think that I need to go exercise my birds and make them good flyers. If I'm just walking <laughs> them one from one side of the pen to the other, that's not going to do any right. difference, huh? <laughs> <laughs> no. Although that would be pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you noticed, is there one species of birds that are easier to raise than another? Um, not really. Um, all of our pheasants, we don't get into like much, like we, the only exotic bird we have is the mutant. Um, so other than that, it's just your, your general. And that's why we do it just because they're general. They're going to be, um, you know, easy, just equally as, um, easy to raise as long as you know what you're doing. But, um, no, like even the Manchurian, the ringneck, the Kansas, they're all pretty equal. Mm hmm and I'm thinking like, cause people that want to raise quail, I know, I wonder if it's just the, the smaller the birds get, the more delicate or difficult that they are to raise. Have you guys ever yeah. dabbled with quail at all? We have not. No. And, um, you know, we do get quite a bit, quite a few questions about quail, but unfortunately, um, none of us know anything really about quail cause we just never got into it. So, mm -hmm. um, that I'm not sure. How long have you had Chucker in the mix there? Um, we had, so this is my seventh chick season. And when I first started, we have a Chucker red leg. Um, and I would say three years ago. Yeah, three years ago, we switched over to the regular Chucker. Um, so we've had, I mean, as far as I've been here, we've had, a, we've had the Chucker, a Chucker or a Chucker red leg, which the Chucker red leg is just a Chucker bred with a French. What are people doing that are buying chucker from you guys besides dog training? Um, a lot of it is dog training. There's actually quite a few people that actually hunt them. Um, otherwise, even trying to release them. I know it's kind of hard because they're not really native, but we do have a couple of people that are, um, you know, trying to release them just on their land just to see if they come back and repopulate. Interesting. But there's, is there a high demand for them? Um, I would say the only high demand would be for, um, you know, dog trainers, um, predator control. What, what would you recommend, you know, when we have the, the flight pens out there? Um, I live, I live in Western Montana, so everything wants to eat you and yes, yes. <laughs> out here. Um, <laughs> what would you recommend? I mean, as far as, you know, fox raccoons, um, there's no chance with the mountain lion, but what about yeah, right. those other guys? <laughs> <laughs> bears. Um, Actually, the bears really love chickens. <laughs> yeah. See, I'm not too sure on the bears. Um, the, we don't really have, and if we have bears, they're black bears and they're up north. Um, so I'm not, we don't have the bear problem here. <laughs> so unfortunately, I'm not sure. But um, <laughs> as far as like your your raccoons, hawks, eagles, um, possums, all the fox, coyotes, um, you know, you could always find like a, a licensed trapper um, that traps and releases them. Okay. There's nothing we can deter 
raccoon with? Like there's like those little red lights or blinking something. Yeah. Do those work yeah, at all? Do you know? I, I am not sure. We don't use any of that kind of stuff. We just, um, you know, just have a, like a, we keep, keep traps and then, um, you know, and then also we do have a really great, um, farm management crew too, that will go around our pens and inspect our pens and stuff like that. So they can see it. And if they see something, obviously they're going to put extra traps out to try to trap it and release it somewhere, you know, for our trapper to, to take and release somewhere else. Well, if people want to start breeding birds, like mm-hmm. if they would buy a couple adults from you, will they just in, it right away be a breeding pair or how does the work, how's that work? Yeah. So it's, pheasants don't really pair up um but we do say if you plan on breeding pheasants and having your own breeding stock we um, always recommend one rooster for every 10 to 12 hens and then if you get more you know more roosters than that then you're, the roosters are just going to fight each other and you know unfortunately kill until there's one um, remaining but um there's not really a pair and as far as once they're mature they can breed so um, usually around 18 and even a little bit sooner, they can start going into, um, you know, and get ready for breeding. So as soon as they're, um, mature around 18, 21 weeks, they can, they can breed, um, hmm. breeding pheasants also relies on natural sunlight and, um, not even natural. Sometimes people light them as well with lights. Um, but as long as they get like 10 to 12 hours of, of light, then they can actually breed as well. But okay. usually they start in the spring cause that's when you know, the sunlight gets more and more each day. Mm -hmm. Does the pen setup look any different for breeding than it would regular? Nope. You're just going to have a lot more hens in there to roosters is all. Okay. And uh, nesting boxes, do you add those in? Yep. Yep. You can add those in. A lot of times you'll actually see them just in the dirt um, or, you know, the um, sand or whatever kind of enclosure. Ours is dirt with, um, we have natural um, cover in there like sorghum and corn and other stuff, um, tall grass. And then, you know, a lot of times you'll just find them out on the ground. So we have a, um, an egg picker crew that go out every hour. So that way the eggs aren't sitting on the ground, getting bacteria and stuff. And we'll grab whatever, you know, go through the entire pen and grab whatever eggs they can find. Hmm. So they won't clutch them up. Is that, is that typical in the wild too? They just lay them all over randomly. Yes. Yep. Bizarre. Yeah, huh. I know it's so weird. That is weird. So I'm assuming like you don't have to do it like chickens. You don't necessarily want them raised. So yep, just no, you don't have the ground. To. Right. Okay. Yep. Any other soil considerations that we need to do for parasite control? Do you, you know, cleaning them out? Do you use anything particular to kill diseases? We don't. So ours, um, we get all of our mature pheasants off the farm, hopefully by mid-March, end of March. And then that gives us time. Every time a pen is emptied, we re- we till it. Um, so that way it's tilled and fresh until the next batch come in, um, you know, sometime in late spring, um, depending on when that pen was emptied. But, um, yeah, we just till it, and we've had a great success with it. Um, and, I mean, we might use something, but I don't think we have in the – you know, recently. Um, but I'm not too sure on, you know, if there's any, um, kind of stuff we put on the ground or anything after we till it up. Okay. What would you say is the most important piece of raising pheasant or chucker? Would it be water quality, nutrition, um, parasite control? What do you, what do you think? I would say the the number one thing is nutrition. So um, we actually work with, we'll actually even work with anyone, you know, if somebody is having problems with feed, um, you know, you even themselves can have it tested at their, lo- their local feed plant um, to see, you know, what something is high. But nutrition is best. That's why we always recommend that 27, 28% and then gradually lowering it because that's going to give you, you know, the tail quality um, and everything that they're looking for in a bird. Okay. Is food out all the time or do you guys do feedings throughout throughout the day? Nope. We feed them, um, once a day. So we actually have the huge feed bins we have, um, 
and we fill it up and then every day we'll just go and refill them so they have access to food and water at all times. Um, the minute they run out of food or in water is when they're going to be stressed out and you know like I said when they stress out their bodies just kind of shut down and um, you're going to have more mit- mortality that way. And if somebody wants to start raising birds in, in bigger numbers, I saw that you guys actually put on like a seminar for that. Yeah. So our seminar is actually wrapping up to register at the end of this week um, is when we close it. And it actually is biannual. So it'll be again in 2024, um, usually in March, usually like the second week of March. Um, and it's usually a Sunday through a Wednesday and we get vets. Um, we get other people in the industry, we get a uh, UW, um, you know, poultry scientists and everything like that, that go over all the ins and outs of raising. And, you know, you don't see a company that kind of sells and, um, you know, tells their story and tells their secrets, but we're one and the owner bill feels that it's really important to um, be as a team than to be against each other. So um, it's actually a really good opportunity to meet um, everyone in the industry and uh, everyone's with you instead of against you, you know, and um, share secrets about what works and what doesn't work. That's fantastic. What are some of the topics covered in the seminar this year that you can tell people about? Yeah, so I'm not sure. um, I'm not sure of the topics just because our um, account or our um, general manager handles that, but okay. um, it is on our website though at pheasant.com. It's actually one of the first things you see, um, and you can download the schedule and itinerary. But um, I know it has a lot of good information this year um, about raising biosecurity and stuff like that. Um, you know, mm. pred- predator control, and um, you know, you get a tour of the farm. It's on um, a bus, but you get, you know, kind of like that virtual tour as well to see kind of how we have our things set up, what we do and um, our kind of day-to-day operation. Neat. And I saw that you guys have several videos on your website too, of just tours of the farm um, Mm -hmm. showing different setups. Like you said, you have plans on there for, was it flight pens? Yeah, so we have all of our manuals. So we have the flight construction manual. Um, We actually have um, a gentleman on the farm, um, one of the managers, executive managers now that drew all the pictures of all the tools you need. And um, it literally is step by step of building a flight pen. And then we have incubation manuals. We have a rearing guide to kind of help you um, along the way with rearing your chicks. Um, And then we have videos as well. And that Um, under the resources. We even have past seminars as well, if anybody wants to see kind of how it was, you know, a couple of years ago. Fantastic. And I'll be putting some of those links then directly into the show notes here to make it people for easy, make it easy for people to, uh, to access those. Um, Yeah. Where are you guys at with bird numbers right now? If people still want to do some ordering of chucker or pheasant, is there availability yet for 2022? So 2022, we still have availability for chicks. Um, I mean, it might be a little bit slimmer. We do have um, hen chicks for sale um, as well. Um, You know, a lot of times people see that we're sold out for the roosters or the straight run, which is the hens and the roosters mix. Um, But we do have a lot of hens. And um, if anybody is using those for training or whatever, those work actually really perfect for training just because they're a little bit smaller. Um, But, I mean, you could just go on our website and – May, I think is sold out, but we still have a lot in um, June and July. Okay. What about for Chucker? Chucker, there's still some on there for um, Chucker. Those are doing pretty well. Um, And I think we still have some availability in June and July as well. Okay, great. And April, what is your favorite pheasant recipe? Oh, my favorite. I have two. Um, but if I would choose one over the other, I would say um, my favorite is pheasant meatballs, um, which is pretty easy. I just take make gr- or get ground pheasant from our store here, or you can even um, order it through our website. But it's just ground pheasant that I mix kind of like um, with a little bit of uh, Worcestershire sauce, actually, and some breadcrumbs. And I just make meatballs, put it in, um, you know, the oven or even a fry pan, like you can pan fry it. And then um, either we'll do marinara with them, but a lot of times we just do barbecue, which is equally as good. 
Excellent. That sounds delicious. I want to try that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I do I, like tacos as well. Oh, tacos. What, how do you do the tacos then? So again, I just use the ground, um, ground pheasant. And then I just, I actually have like a, um, a seasoning um, jar for taco seasoning. And I just throw some taco seasoning in there and then just treat it like a taco without hamburger. I just use pheasant instead. Perfect. I love that. Yeah. And I noticed that you guys are going to be at Pheasant Fest as well. Yes. Yep. So we'll be at Pheasant Fest. There's three lovely ladies. There's um, two Sarahs and um, Alexi as well. Um, and they will be representing. We will have some snack sticks. Um, so we have classic, we have honey barbecue, um, and we have a spicy um, snack stick that we'll have in our summer sausage. And then for the pet food side, um, we will have our packages of freeze dried feet and freeze dried necks as well. So oh, cool. Yeah. Very awesome. So people can get some um, snacks for their dogs that they have with them right there. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Cool. We know dogs are a huge thing there. So we wanted to uh, make sure we had a little bit of everything. Perfect. And can people order birds through you guys there? Yeah. So um, they, I mean, you can order um, day old chicks, you can order mature birds. Mature birds are very seasonal. Obviously that it's in the fall. Um, and right now we are sold out just because we're getting close to the end of the season. Um, but if you want to order like mature birds, you know, for next season, she's actually taking orders now. Um, Mm -hmm. and then we have, I mean, she sells birds for taxidermy and by she, I mean, Sarah, one of the Sarah's. And then we have our dress food line as well. That's pretty busy. Um, and she has, by she, I mean, Karina, (laughs) sorry. (laughs) And, um, she has. Um, I mean, right now I, we're limited on our whole birds, but we have a whole bunch of stuff in our store and our website. I mean, we um, get f- some game meats from other companies as well. So we have venison, we have bison, we have alligator, we have duck, we have rabbit, um, we have quail. So you name it, we have it on our website as well. And then our pet Very food cool. as well. Excellent. Can you give us um, approximate price? I know it, it varies with how many like chicks you order, probably how many eggs, how many adults you order, but like give a general breakdown uh, maybe of price of eggs versus day old chicks versus an adult to give us an idea of maybe, maybe figuring our feeding costs and what makes more sense. Yeah. So if you're thinking eggs, um, eggs are, um, it kind of goes by case, but minimum order is 30 eggs. So between 30 eggs and 360, you're looking at a dollar or two an egg. Um, And as far as chicks go, you're looking, you know, minimum quantity for pheasants is 10, chuckers is 25. Um, Chuckers are going to be a little bit more expensive, um, but pheasants, they can go from $4.99 to $2.99. And that's giving, you know, up to 100 to 500. Um, And then mature, we one to 10, you're looking at 20. If you're going like 20, if you're looking for 20 birds to 50 birds, it's usually around like 17. Okay. And what is the approximate price for chucker? Chucker for um, the smaller quantities, I believe it is um, a dollar. Let me just check real quick. Yeah. Um, three twenty nine. So it's just going to be a little bit more expensive. That's for the smaller quantities. If you're thinking like a hundred and less, you're looking at just just above like two dollars yeah yeah cool awesome well thank you very much april i I appreciate your time this morning and uh, this is good information because it's if you have the space it's fun to be able to do some bird raising and but there's i feel like there's so many things that go into it and it gets a little bit intimidating so this was helpful to kind of give us an idea of how that should work yeah, yeah. Once you know the ins and outs, it, it you know, it, the first year might be a struggle, but, um, you know, you'll get down what you need and all the necessities and um, rearing tips and stuff like that. But once you have it, you have it. And um, it's actually fun to do. And, um, you know, it's fun to, to, you know, it's not just something to do. It's, it could be a hobby as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I know um, it, it seems like every year, there's, there's a bird shortage at the end of the year, you know, and that's like, that's crazy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That July, August time, 
everybody's looking for birds. And so it's yeah. better to maybe have too many at the beginning of the year that can yeah. carry you out. So, right. And my, um, the owner bill and my production manager are always like, Hey, April, if we could sell another million chicks, could we? And I'm like, uh, probably, <laughs> but yeah, so we actually sell about 1.3 million. Um, we ra- we actually hatch 1.7 million, but we actually keep about 500,000 to the farm for mature customers. And then, you know, the 1.3 and um, beyond go to customers that buy them, which is kind of crazy to think about. That is crazy, but very cool. Super cool that you guys have such a big, successful operation like that. Yeah. I'd love to come tour it sometime. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Thank you so much, April. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem at all. Thank you. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Bird Dog Babe podcast. I hope you were able to learn something from this episode and maybe even feel inspired to try raising some birds of your own this year. You have a few months to prepare for their arrival and be sure to get your order in ASAP. I absolutely love raising our own chicks and I'm excited to help build a couple flight pens this year. If you have any additional insight and tips, please share them with me. Be sure to check out the sponsors of this podcast, Purina Pro Plan, Boss Shot Shells, Onyx Hunt, and our partners, Siren and Dakota 283. And join the Bird Dog Babe community at patreon.com forward slash the bird dog babe. This episode was brought to you by Puffin Drinkware. Get yourself and a friend a Puffin koozie for your next dog training session together at thebirddogbabe.com forward slash puffin and use promo code birddogbabex. PDW for 10% off your order. And don't forget to support the conservation organizations of the birds you're chasing after and the public lands in which you hunt.